This is Ross Coulthard, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and it's a long overdue breakdown for August 2022. Joining me is Dan, as always, back from Sweden. I said it a Swedish accent, I don't know if I've been. <laughs> it was good. It's a great accent. And uh, yeah, I came back complete with Stockholm Syndrome and uh, yeah, missing Olaf very much. It was a great trip and I'm sure you guys will see photos from it and stuff over the next few days. Absolutely. And also joining us uh, again from the review we done last time on James Fox's Out of the Blue is Nathan, uh, a waif soul on Twitter and other social media platforms, and also a host on about 40 different podcasts as well. Uh, so, <laughs> 45 uh, Nathan, now, actually. 45. <laughs> yes. Things things move so quickly. But Nathan, welcome back. Um, Thank you. Listen, back. a lot to get through. And uh, this changed within the last 12 hours, didn't it? Because we'd made notes on various things a few weeks ago, Dan, and then it changed over the last couple of weeks. And then literally overnight, We've totally thrown it out the window and updated it again because yeah. Ross Coulthard's documentary aired on Seven News in Australia and there's been an article on The Hill just released. So we've kind of middled it about a little bit, but we've got quite a few talking points to get through. We'll do a couple of the main ones and then fire through some of the others as well for some discussion points. But it's been a bit of a hectic, busy couple of weeks. Uh, and again, I always say for those who say nothing's happening in the world of UFOs, when you take a step back and actually sum it up and put it down in bullet points, Again, it just, it's been busy. It really, really has. And the first one we have to touch on in the main is Ross Coulthard's latest documentary. Um, documentary, news piece, bit of, bit of both. Documentary news piece. Let's go with Anci- that. Ancient Aliens episode. <laughs> um, it was titled Out of This World and was on 7 News in Australia. I'll put the YouTube link to it down below. It's still uh, in the description, not below here, because you can't see anything below here. Lucky you. Um, it'll be in the description of the podcast. Um it's not aired anywhere else yet. It's not on YouTube officially. So if it gets taken down, people will just have to wait on the, the YouTube link for it going up properly. But you can access it online. Um, we've all watched it. It's it's received pretty mixed reviews overall on, on Twitter, on social media, when I've been having a look as well. Hosted by Michael Usher. Again, I believe he was on Ross's last piece. Um, so there must be an affiliation there with the channel and as a host as well. Um, where do we start with this one? I suppose I'm going to start with a positive, and I say positive singular, because it really seems to me that the big takeaway from this piece, uh, 48 minutes long, I think it was, 46 minutes long, there was be. Gary Nolan's presence being the standout in the whole piece, uh, and maybe the only one. I think that's for many people as well. Um, Dan, uh, what about yourself? What's the positives on this one? I don't think you were a massive fan and you said such online. Yeah, I mean, a, a big part of what kind of perturbed me about it was mostly the the promos. You know, we had that kind of hype train thing happen again with there's going to be irrefutable evidence of, of out of this world presence on Earth. And actually, it turns out that that was just the promo producers. It was nothing to do with Ross and Ross was frustrated by that as well. So I've kind of cut some slack and reassessed, you know, where, where I kind of sit with it. And, and I think it was very much a documentary of two halves. For the first half, we kind of had a rehash of or, or reintroduction to new people of the uh, Tic Tac, Go Fast, Gimbal videos. Yep. And then mixed in with that, we had Gary Nolan talking about the cover up and kind of giving some very frank answers that I think a lot of us from the community would have seen when he was talking on Carlson Tucker and things like that. But, you know, for I always call it the mum test, you know, my, my mum wouldn't have seen that so seeing that on a news channel would have been explosive um it it would have gotten a lot more attention than than the online kind of interviews we're used to seeing and then the second half was concerning a a silver sphere uh that was in the possession of jim marlin that came with quite uh you know an out there story and and that's the bit that people seem to be debating over whether they they liked or not i i for one wasn't a fan of the kind of anthropomorphized anthropomorphizing of the sphere um you you know there were shots of it watching the television and chilling on the porch watching the sunset and it got it got a little silly in the way that it was treated i thought we'll we'll come back to that one definitely because i think i'm quite similar to yourself in terms of how the the sphere was portrayed that's a weird sentence to say um (laughs) nathan what about yourself positives from this documentary was it gary nolan for you or was there something else you took from it 
No, I definitely think it is uh, Gary Nolan, the continuing of the Gary Nolan Roadshow. Uh, he's just excellent on camera and yes. has you know remarkable credentials, and it's great to see him out there in the public, you know, giving more uh, insight and weight behind the topic. And the way I look at this is, look, we're we're continuing the heat. We're continuing to keep the heat level constant on the topic. We're not letting it uh, kind of simmer down. Uh, and the more that it gets into the public, the better. Uh, is it something for the insiders who've been following every little tidbit here and there? Not at all. Uh, I do think that the sphere was interesting, um, but you know, <laughs> I, I also found it a little bit distracting, uh, and uh, you know, reminded me of the uh, like the Pablo Escobar memes where he's kind of like waiting in the different like parts of the of his compound. He's in the standing in the pool. He's staring off in the distance. He's sitting on the swing like that. They literally yeah. did shots like that with, with the sphere. So that was a little bit of a, a strange uh, sidetrack for me. But the, the sound bites from Nolan are awesome. And the more we can kind of pump those out there, the better. I think that, that that's the positive here. Someone has to now make that meme of the sphere on the, the playground in the empty pool, a la Pablo Escobar, as we all know online. That'd be, that'd be a good UFO Twitter Twitter meme, and it could do with a bit of lightheartedness the last few days. So I like that one. Um, before we get to the positives again on Gary Nolan and some of those sound bites, look, you two keep bringing up the sphere. So let's talk about the sphere. Um, we all largely seem to be making a little bit of fun and light about this. However, Jim Marlin, who is a, a manager, promoter, bon viveur extraordinaire, um, seems to have lived quite a life. Very interesting one, I'm sure, as well. Um, he is is put across as one of the men who who got Willie Nelson, famous country singer, famous weed advocate, Um his whole career kickstarted and promoting and, and, and doing what he'd done there. Um, and his story in this is basically that Ross Coulthard goes out to his property and he says that he was, and God, isn't this just very Hollywood, that 40 years ago, he was on Dennis Hopper's bodyguards uh, property who said, do you want to see something cool? And he said, yeah, well, why not? It's Dennis Hopper's bodyguard. Of course you would. And um, he showed him some silver spheres that he had in his his backyard i think it was that he said six or seven of them had fallen from a ufo and he asked jim marlin would you like one and he's like yeah sure so he gave him this this silver sphere like, like puppies yeah yeah like do you want one of these yep just just take it <laughs> right and what we then have is Ross, with the charisma that Ross Coulthart has, and I've said to Dan recently, uh, privately, and not in a slight, but Ross Coulthart to me is the Australian Jeremy Corbell. He has that same charisma, same aura, same flair for the dramatic. He's reporting in a serious way. He's very well connected, but he knows how to put on a show in the best way, but also, you know, it has those those dramatic flares and requirements and necessities and ne necessary evils that get a production onto mainstream television that we might not all necessarily agree with from from time to time so the the sphere stuff is where it, it verges a little bit on here's the crazy guy when the way jim marlin's presented we see his life we hear how he has basically carried a sphere with him for 40 years how much of that is artistic license i don't know that's a 50 pound ball of metal that he has apparently carted around the world with him we hear about all these celebrities and famous people having touched the sphere over the years um in that time i'm just curious and i may have missed this i don't think i did he never had the sphere tested as to what it was. He has literally taken on the word of Dennis Hopper's bodyguard that this fell from a UFO. So has carted round a fifty pound bowling ball without so, holes. There's a little more to the story. Um, there, there was a really good interview that the YouTube channel Project Unity did with Ross Coulthard yesterday, and this was after the airing of the documentary. So he was able to follow up on a few things, and he, Ross elaborated on this that basically where Jim got the sphere from that guy had a knock at the door with the authorities taking the spheres. So Jim kept quiet that he had it, basically. Up until this point, it's kind of been a secret that he's had the whole thing. Um, and this is the first time that he's come out publicly to show it off. The sphere is now in the hands of Gary Nolan to test it. Gary Nolan stated that it is human until proven otherwise, which yeah. I wish was a little more present in the documentary because that's what kind of threw me with, with the insistence that it was something other when actually Ross and Gary both think that it's probably human but testing it and getting that extraterrestrial technology possibility off the table or you know otherwise 
is just good science and so it kind of needs to be done it's a claim that we can test and so we should test it i i think that's fair but i don't think that's necessarily what was reflected in the documentary so i hadn't seen the the unity interview so again folks go and check that one out um following up with ross coulthart but again the question for me is he's had it 40 years he's not kept it secret because he's been going around the hollywood elite letting them rub his shiny silver sphere <laughs> so you know at, at no point not that it would get out to to those shady characters, the men in the shadows, the men in black, you know. But he's he's not kept it secret. He's carted it about with him. More more kept it on the down low, maybe. <sighs> yeah, I mean, he's certainly not been on social media and on you know news shows showing it off and kind of yeah. saying, look at this, look at this. You know, it's on a one by one basis with people until now, uh, and now he's done it in quite a big way, um, where he's promoted it to the entire world. So he's clearly at a point where he's he's happy that to do this. Yeah, for me, it, I don't understand why Ross reported when they weigh the sphere at some point on the, and he goes, "Wow, it's fifty pounds." Now that is strange. Why? Why would the the weight of the ball being fifty pounds exactly be strange? Like, it's. I mean, surely that would point, if anything, more to it being man made. That if it was being mass produced, I've seen people online and. Pardon my ignorance, I'd never read it fully, but someone was saying about iron balls are produced in Texas like this for some sort of reason, en masse. So it would make sense that if something was being produced, you would make it to an exact measurement or weight. So why wouldn't it weigh 50 pounds? You know, I, I didn't understand that, to be honest. And I don't know, again, if either of you can shed light on that. Yeah, I mean, it it suggests a terrestrial origin, right? It's, it's a really convenient uh imperial measurement which is a very human measurement it could be that something else came here and has that system too but even humans across the globe we don't all have the same measurement systems and throughout history we had different things too so it it very much for me suggests that it's human in origin and probably a geographic location as well yeah, and it doesn't uh, necessarily, you know, mean that it's not, you know, interesting or worthy of study. I think that's Gary Nolan's point as well: is that look, you know, we've had some people making some big claims. We should put those claims to the test. Maybe there'll be it'll be nothing, and that, that's fine. That's the purpose of science. We should look into these things, and if it's interesting, let's keep going. If it's not, let's just dis discard it. And I think maybe the the worry or the concern here with this particular, uh, you know, episode or anecdote is that you know, if it is not nothing, then it just kind of lends to that narrative that a lot of these stories are nothing that, you know, people yeah. kind of invent something around an object and a whole mythology comes up around the object and none of it is actually real. So it, to me, it could do a lot of harm. Um, at the same time, those of us who are really into this topic, we know that sometimes the story is a little more complicated. It, it's it, something can be quite mundane, but can also have a, a pretty profound impact on a person or the people who interact with it, who that, you know, maybe that later on influences them to study something else or to pursue the topic in a different way, which I think we would view as a net positive. So, but I, I don't think that's something that people that would, you know, kind of look at the outcome of the story as a, as a, you know, positive takeaway for ufology or for the topic in general. Yeah. And, and two things I just double checked, um, 50 pounds would be 22.6 kilograms, which doesn't quite sound as sexy or suspicious, doesn't it? Like, oh, it weighs 22.6 kilos. Hmm, we move on. Um, so yeah, it was, it's one of those things. It's an interesting object, but I would almost put every one of my 45 pounds I've got in my bank on it, that it's, um, it's man-made, that that's a human object for whatever reason. I also think, Nathan, I agree what you're saying there, that there's, there's a story to these things. And there's a very human story that if Jim genuinely has had this object for 40 years, that's been a massive part of his life. And he's had this thing that he's always had, you know, this air of mystery. And no doubt it's been a great story he's had to tell people. And imagine he did find out, no, nah, it's just an iron ball. And he's, he's literally been carting this around. And I have to do, I have to say and give the context that Jim does give testimony that he's, he's in various times, the ball's moved on its own, or he tells that he was sitting with his feet on the ball and it sh a flash of light happened and he shot across the room six to 10 feet. So again, we have to take that at face value. And I always like to, you know, give the, the testimony the benefit of the doubt. And yeah, sure. Uh, if that has happened, then that certainly lends credence to the ball having some sort of property. But if we find out that it is just prosaic and a big iron ball that's used for, I don't know, thinking back to the movie Twister, you know, measuring tornadoes or something like that, 
then it loses that air of mystery and that's a little bit of his life that just dies with that so yeah i hope something comes back they they take a test they, they get some rust from it gary nolan asks ross coltart to collect some rust and it's left on a cliffhanger dan like you say that we're going to come back to it and let you know what the results are i would almost definitely suspect that next seven news documentary confirms that it was either unknown un- inconclusive or very much man-made well, and let's not forget, too, that this is not the first object Gary Nolan has studied that is light like this, right? So in the Trinity case where he was given the bracket object from uh, Jacques Vallée and, and Paula Harris, you know, he very much looks like a just a mundane sort of metal formed bracket that you might have found on a piece of farm equipment. And he studied that material as well. So, you know, this this here is where I, I'm also getting a little nervous, right? It's like, well, we're, we're testing things, which is great, and we should. We should test the, those claims. But if we're repeatedly cl- testing things that turn out to be n- nothing exceptional, then I think we've got a little bit of a problem. We need, we need to refine our threshold for what we're accepting as a testable item. That said, we also know in history, though, with there's a lot of stories in, in, in ufology history of things that seem pretty basic, or simple uh, that really do have this kind of bizarre uh, story around them that, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, you know, how do we fit that absurdity, you know, into the overall picture? And I think, you know, those of us who are familiar here, we we understand that absurdity is kind of just part and parcel of the of the topic itself. And, and do you know what? On that bracket from Trinity, I remember I can't, I can't remember who I was speaking to. If it was George Knapp, or I spoke to Paola Harris about the the object. But sometimes a little bit of outside the box thinking is required. And you can you can look at that bracket from the Trinity crash as well. It very much looks man made. Why would anything inside an alien spacecraft look like that? But what I was told was. If you think of it, it doesn't mean that it wasn't inside the alien spacecraft, but apparently it was put in there by the US Army or whoever it was went onto the craft after it had crashed and set up their own apparatus inside. And it was taken from the craft, but actually was man-made, but it actually was inside the craft. And I was ah, oh, I never thought of that it being something that we had left behind within one of these craft and that that was quite an interesting uh, interesting take on that piece. The, there's an interesting kind of idea presented that these spheres are kind of part of a planetary defense system uh that that kind of stood out to me as a you know maybe a testable hypothesis that when something other comes into the atmosphere here these spheres are what mobile mobilize to to get rid of the intruder um and on a little more digging with that it turns out that the the person who came up with that theory thinks that it, it will explain a lot of kind of poltergeist activity and things like that, where the spheres will push people away from them so that they don't get these huge doses of radiation when they're doing what they're doing. But again, that's a testable hypothesis, and, and it's quite an outlandish one as well. Another one that came up was that it was Jim himself who was the anomalous person uh, factor, and he was actually making the ball move. Now, again, testable. We can do that. But do you guys do you guys think that would you have liked it a bit more if the results were in the documentary for better or worse? Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. Yeah, same same for me. It's that it's that kind of carrot dangling that that was what I found frustrating. Yeah, it seemed like one of those an executive may have said, "Can we get this shoehorn done?" Because when you talk about a documentary of two halves, the second half we hear more about Jim's experiences. So not only is he a guy who is presented with an incredible object, he's also a guy who has been abducted, basically, and taken through a wall as a child and told his parents. And I just think the way that's presented, and people know about my thoughts on UFO documentary music, it didn't help. It then got very ancient aliens. I think the overall presentation was was very... I've put down here a typical UFO documentary from the 2000s, a bit of ancient aliens and a lot of unidentified thrown in all kind of mishmashed in there together with very high production values and i don't think that helps and that that leads me on to i never thought i would say this but michio kaku being in these documentaries now i i would love to speak to him on the podcast i would love to hear him do some some really longer form interviews with people like alex friedman like a, a joe rogan you know with a kurt jai mungo guys like that nathan yourselves you know you guys or, or with us whoever talking about the subject in a longer broader form because i feel what we're getting now is he appears on these william shatner-esque documentaries and very quick sound bites 
and he knows what he needs to say. Uh, he comes across as very charismatic and he's an incredibly clever guy, a very serious scientist to talk about the subject. But the way he's presented, I just don't think can come across great. And that the sound bites are very much for that general public looking for a little bit of a almost Doc Brown back to the future type scientist discussing the UFO subject. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way because he's a very brilliant mind. But the way it's being presented and how he's used in these, like the the bit about, you know, steal something from an alien spaceship, you know, there's the proof. And it's, ah, I imagine him talking with someone really seriously on the subject. That would be elaborated on. It would be expanded on. And it would make a lot of sense as to what he actually is getting at there. And yeah, so for me, I think it limits the impact of the seriousness of this. And it, I think the tone just has to change on on these types of documentaries. But it's not being made for the well-versed UFO connoisseur. It's being made for an audience like my my stepmom and dad live in Australia. Um, and they know about Seven News. They, they watch it. They know Ross Coulter as a journalist. And they knew this was coming on. I don't know if they've watched it yet. I've not had a chance to speak to them. But it's, it's for members of the public who maybe go, oh, let's give that a watch. And I don't know how far through that documentary members of the public would get before they switched off or channel hopped especially as it starts to get into this guy got abducted and and that kind of am i being harsh on that or is that is that what you guys thought no i i think you're spot on you know it, it got to a certain point for me where i was just like i don't i don't know who this is for anymore i i kind of feel like i i'm required to have this knowledge of the wider subject to kind of be able to put the sphere into context and to put the abductions into context but at the same time I thought, well, you know, if someone out there is going to watch this, I can, I can kind of feel the eyes rolling already, you know. The yeah, takeaways. I mean, well, I'm just going to say it's it. It does have that, uh, you know, sort of water cooler effect, though. You know, did you see that? It was kind of cre- crazy, a little bit yeah. weird, made me laugh. You know, my worry would be, does that sort of anecdote and and the sort of sensationalism that Kaku is now, I think, kind of being known for, does it overshadow? the real meat of the show, which is the conversations that are had with Tim Burchette uh, and, and Gary Nolan. You know, there's a lot of substance there that I think has a lot of credibility, you know, so if you don't lose sight of those points and, and, and don't get too fixated on these, uh, you know, interesting claims or whatnot, then it's a, it's a real positive. Um, but yeah, I mean, w- at what point, and this is, this is the question I would ask is at what point do we transition from these kinds of, pieces to something that is incredibly substantive, you know, and to your point, Andy, you know, where we have scientists like Dr. Kaku who aren't just giving, you know, sort of the, the rosiest speculative response on, on what we're seeing, but are really getting into some of the detail uh, that would satisfy our, our genuine scientific curiosity here. Yeah. There there was um, a a point that Ross mentioned on the, the interview with Project Unity where he was talking about a gentleman he spoke to who he worked out statistically kind of how the human genome had developed and how likely it was for that to happen. And it sounded like this really wonderful in-depth conversation. And the gentleman supposedly came out with, you know, it's not very likely at all. It seems that the phrase that he used was that we were given a cosmic shove by something at some point. That sounded like a really interesting conversation. Why wasn't that in the show? Mm. Yeah, I I think it's one of those that, Overall, for me, I'll ask you gents first before I give my thoughts and we'll move on. Uh, Nathan, do you recommend people watch this and why or why not? I'd recommend it. I thought it was entertaining. It's not too long. Uh, There's some great sound bites in it. I would probably, in sending it to someone, say, you know, prepare yourself for the sphere in a rocking chair scene. I mean, like, I don't even know how you, you know, because like (laughs) you're going to laugh at that. I mean, it's just it is it was funny, but I I don't see that it, I didn't think of it as a negative. I think it's still positive. It keeps the attention where we want it. Uh, There's a lot of good things that we can clip from the show and, and and continue kind of push, put pushing out there. And I'm all for that. Dan. So for me, I pretty much, as soon as I finished, I gave it a rating of a three, three spheres out of 10. Hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend this to people just because I feel like so much of it was really far fetched. I can see what Ross was doing with the abduction stuff to kind of speak to the why are they here part of of the conversation, but to to go from you know the rehash of the stuff that 
we're all kind of following through US Congress and speaking to Tim Burchant and Gary Nolan to then these really loosey-goosey kind of stories, uh, I, I feel like it really undermined itself. Let me ask a question then. Um, and just give me a yes or a no, both of you. Okay, Dan, I'll start with you on this. <laughs> I, I like that you say my name first. Give me a yes or no, Dan. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to overrun on this. and it, it's, 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 I don't want this to sound harsh, but does this these documentaries, when they, they end up a documentary of two halves, and this happened with one of the other ones we reviewed, Dan, earlier this year, was it not The Observers, but the one with Dolan and, and Greenwald and Linda Moulton Howe and... Um, all of that crew in it, do you remember? And we said it was a documentary of two halves again. It, it may have been The Observers, I can't remember, but one of those, where it felt like they ran out of steam and material, so they had to shoehorn a load of random stuff in the second half. And I wonder, was there a remit for Ross to produce a piece which there there was material for? But again, is it too easy to fill it in with, yeah, let's stick some abduction stuff in there, let's shoehorn the gimbal, tic-tac, go fast stuff in there and make the most of it? Do you think that's what they've done? Or, yeah, no? Um, yes. Yeah, Nathan? And then, and then I, just my uh, reasoning uh, is that like 9 million people have viewed it already and I think yeah. that's what's driving them. Okay, Nathan? That's, that's not fair, Dan. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I also think so. Uh, and ultimately, um, I would say it's worth a watch. It's very well produced. It does very much fall for me between a documentary produced in the, the early 2000s when CGI got a bit better um, an Ancient Aliens episode and a little bit of the, the good stuff from Unidentified thrown in as well. Um, it serves as a nice little recap again of Gimbal, Tic Tac, Go Fast. The, the Sphere stuff is interesting, but I think ultimately misplaced in, in what it's going to be and what it is. But as with any of these pieces, if it gets a few people watching or reading a newsletter or subscribing to you know a blog or listening to a podcast or a YouTube channel that didn't do so before, then that can only be a good thing. You know, that's that's fair enough. And, and I think Ross comes at these things with a really, he's very well intentioned and he treats it very seriously because he is a serious journalist. So yeah, um, for me, give it a watch. Like Nathan says, it's not overly long, but I would sit somewhere between what both Dan and Nathan have said that it's worth a watch, but Dan, keep your expectations low and you, you can't be overly disappointed. So yeah, there we go. Um, the, just this afternoon, 22nd of August, um, an article has been published on thehill.com by Marek von Renenkampf. Marek uh, does a lot of really good commentary, a lot of good articles, and some really good debate is sparked online by Marek as well um, on, on Twitter. And one of the headlines, or the headline from the article, is that Congress in the US now implies UFOs have a non-human origin, um, which is pretty interesting. The article itself is pretty short. The link will be in the description. Um, gents, you've, you've both had time to at least read or skim the article by now. Um, for me, that this one paragraph really stands out, and I'll just read it very quickly. Um, and I quote, most strikingly, Congress's new definition of UFO excludes man-made objects. Over the last seven decades, most UFO sightings involved quote-unquote man-made objects such as misidentified aircraft, balloons, satellites, or drones. Yet now, according to Congress, man-made objects, and again, this is part of the quote, should not be considered under the definition as unidentified aerospace undersea phenomena. Dan, take you to that one. Is this something that a can be looked into a little bit too much and it's just you know in the language and the way these things are now being split up and categorized or is there a little bit more to this we should be looking and, and being quite intrigued by i i find it interesting that Merrick has taken it in this way because he's basing it off language that's in the legislation that's currently yep. going through the house um and and the senate and what that language says is basically that they want to look at all the cases that were reported and they make it very clear that the ones they're interested in are not the ones where the solution is found to be a man-made object. To me, it didn't mean that the definition of UFO has changed to Congress. What it meant was that they were clarifying, hey, hey, no, you keep telling us about drones like you did during the hearings, and we're making it very clear that's not what we're interested in talking about here. We're talking about the anomalies, the things you can't explain. So next time you guys come to US hearings, that better be what we're talking about instead of just, you know, two minutes of there are some sightings that exhibit some characteristics that we can't explain. The whole thing better be about that because that's what we want to hear about. 
Nathan, what's your take? Yeah, so on that particular sort of line of reasoning, I mean, there's a different way to look at that. And, and I'm not saying I look at it this way, but you could look at that language and say, and come to the conclusion, what they're saying there is, once we've come to the determination that it is man-made, we don't care about it anymore. So, you know, if, if you've essentially, if it's gone from a UFO to an IFO, we don't care about it. So keep going after the UFOs until we've eliminated, you know, everything that we can explain. And then let's see what's left. I think, you know, overall, my, my takeaway from this article, it's very well written. It's not very long. And it says the quiet part out loud. It takes the pieces of the legislation that are scattered. It's not a, it's not a short little s- section in the in the proposed bill. It's a f- several pages, but it takes the pieces from that and it extracts the really meaty bits and just draws the conclusion. And that's what I think is the most surprising to me is that we, we, we just haven't had the media in general, look at this and go, wait, what are you saying? Like, I mean, I'm reading, I'm reading this and I, these are the, the natural logical conclusions to arrive at Yet No one seems to be doing that in, in the public conversation. It's just like, oh, that's some other, you know, UFO language legislation. Isn't that kind of neat? Yeah. But look what it actually says. You know, if you, if you really come to that, if you really read it, get into it in the context, you cannot help but think just as he states in the article, that these legislators have been shown some very, very compelling pieces of information that have prompted them, not just on a partisan basis, but across the aisle to get together and demand that this kind of effort be undertaken. That is huge, huge. And it just baffles me. And it baffles you guys like that we're, we're just not seeing this kind of bubble up to the, the level of attention that it should be. And this is like, you know, civilization changing kind of language here. Um, so anyway, I hope that that article gets a lot of uh, play and, and passed around because to me, it's it, it's not long winded, really gets to the point and says what the, you know, to me, what, what the language is pointing to. Unlike myself, which can be long winded, doesn't always get to the point <laughs> and the language isn't always understandable. <laughs> um, I just want to ask on that, both of you, okay, I've not even got this written down to discuss, so I'm going to try and word this, word this properly. Looking at that sort of progress, and you've got Gary Nolan on that documentary with Ross talking about the whistleblowers are coming out. That's one of the big sound bites people are talking about. We are hearing that the immunity language is potentially finished or going to be in legislation, that people's NDAs and such will be able to be kind of forgotten about in, in, in Congress to, to speak openly on, on the UFO topic uh, in the terms of the secrecy and classifications and everything. So some really interesting stuff is going to come out. If this is all a massive push for defence funding and people at Lou Elizondo are at psyops and counterintelligence tricks and everything else, at what point does this stop? Because for me, it seems like if that is the case, then the jokes get going a bit far now. Because how long is this going to go on before they turn around and it does go back in the bottle, you know? Well, we, we, ha- we have a number of people, uh, reporters and, and, you know, people in the community saying that this has all been about drones the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. That, that actually drones are getting pretty out there and we need to be able to protect ourselves. So and that is fair. Kind of using like, we'll the say that some, oh, some sure. of it, some of it will be really advanced drones. That's That's fair. But just to point out, those the apparatus to, you know, kind of defend against those kinds of threats, they've been funded. That's happened. That's done already. So if it was for those things, we would be done with this now. You know, pe- people would be slinking off into the shadows and not talking about changing that definition or implying that Congress are going after genuine, you know, anomalous uh, phenomena. So, yeah, like we like you say, we we would have seen the end of that by now if it was about drones. Yeah. Nathan, what about yourself on that? Yeah, I don't see uh, why Congress wouldn't want to fund an effort into advanced technologies if we actually had them, you know, or if if we were pursuing them. There's no need to sort of add this layer of, you know, UAP, otherworldly technology that might not be from the Russians or the Chinese. We don't need that pretense to, to spend money on cool war technology we've been doing it for decades we love doing it. it's like our one of our favorite things to do you know just look at our annual budget we dump so much money into defense it's obscene so i, I really don't see why we need 
this cover story, you know, this elaborate ruse to get money from uh, our lawmakers. They're they're more than happy to do that every year over and over again. So, uh, you know, I think to with the credentials of these individuals who've been pushing for this, the long time that they have been in in government and and the number of people who they have worked with, influenced and can influence, it's absolutely absurd. It's absolutely absurd. They would risk their professional reputations on a, a, a total fabrication. Like it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. These are not, you know, men and women prone to fantasy. These are people who are very serious, you know, who have high credentials, who have seen a lot of sensitive information and they're not dumb. They're very smart. You know, they can come to their own conclusions and if they're arriving at these conclusions and then sharing that same information with people who can make decisions, like that's why we are here. It is not some, you know, fantasy novel that just got passed around the halls of Congress. Let me tag on to that. This is probably a good place to bring in this other news piece, but just to, to put on the end of this part, um, Bill Nelson, NASA Administrator, and Ronald Moultrie, the Undersecretary of Defense uh, for Intel and Security, I think that's the, the overall title, um, recently met up and we got the handshake photo and they've agreed that NASA and uh, OUSDI, I think is the correct abbreviation, it will be working together on the subject of, of UFOs, UAP. Um Again, that seems a, a big step forward. And this is just me, like, you know, my opinion, folks. But again, folks say, yeah, NASA know the truth. NASA are an organization. NASA are filled with offices and people like you and I and there's human error and everything else comes into it and bias. So maybe NASA don't know the truth. Maybe some folk at NASA are far more involved and knowledgeable than others. However, right at the top of that pile at the moment is Bill Nelson, who is very well briefed on the subject of UFOs, given his, his previous role, um, where he was basically given some of these briefings we've heard about, no doubt by folks like Eric Davis and others. So he's seen some of this good stuff. He's probably seen your, your 23 minute long videos and the likes, you know, some of these really interesting photographs and he's he's pushing the ufo subject from within nasa and now they're getting involved with the government so again i ask you i ask you both are we looking at a push for funding which you're both saying doesn't look likely or what's the end game here that nasa are now getting involved dan i'll come to you first well we, we've had a lot of um or we've seen a lot of criticism that the actual budget for the nasa study of uap was and correct me if wrong was about 100k up front which yeah. a lot of people are saying that's not even enough to get two two interns on computers looking at stuff on youtube but i think that's kind of exactly the point that's what the study is right now is just a bunch of people kind of going out and going okay so what what is here and i would expect that budget to go up but i mean that's that's money down the drain if this is all pretend and the the inkling that I'm getting is that, like you say, these organizations are made up of lots of different people, lots of different departments. And my feeling is that finally the grown-ups are arriving to have this conversation out into in the open and with the public and say, you know, there's a there's now so much conversation about this that we're kind of entering into the the period of time that someone named Tom Thomas Kuhn would call the paradigm shift, where things are starting to change and we're taking the conversation more seriously because the pile's so big. We need to look at it and we need to figure it out because there's clearly something here. Otherwise, these hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of people across the world wouldn't have been talking about this for this long. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you're, you know, echoing both of your points, these organizations, you know, some of them have more information than others. Uh, the low sort of amount of money that is put into this effort by NASA, to me, and if you're on the UFO side of this uh, equation, I think you can look at that from the standpoint of don't spend a lot of money if you already know what the answer is going to be, you know? So, uh, you know, I saw that my uh, my good, good friend, Darren, Exo Academia, essentially sort of hinted at this idea as well, which is that, you know, if, you're, if your kids get old enough, you kind of start uh, introducing them to some truths about the wider world. And, you, and sometimes you'll do that as parents by, you know, giving them an easy on-ramp. You know, like here's a let let's look into the evidence for Santa Claus. You know, is, is, is there really any good evidence here? Let's take a look at the cookies and, you know, and see who's eating them or whatever. You know, so you, you already know the answer. You know, we're going to get but you're starting out with these really sort of easy 
uh, you know, simple approaches of inquiry. And so that could very well be what's happening here is that this provides both the organization and those in the organization who've been focused on the science, but also the wider scientific community and the public with the permission and an easy on ramp to get into the, this topic and take it more seriously. And that's what you would need if ultimately you're leading up to a more uh, sort of bombastic public type of disclosure that, yeah, there really is something here. And, and you're just kind of setting these organizations up to be in a position where they can not look like they're total fools, you know, where they can say, oh yeah, we're, we've been studying a little bit. We're interested. We're not saying we're not now we're, now we're ready to help. We're, you know, if that's what you're telling us, what, what we're concluding, we're ready to do it. I would just make a point, Dan, on the 100,000 being money down the drain, it, it, that's not a lot of money to throw down the drain. I imagine far bigger sums of money, especially in that organization, um, have been thrown down the drain on projects that never probably left paper. But it's it's still a sum of money allocated for a reason. But just for I any mean, of, of the more skeptical people who might be listening thinking, yeah, yeah I mean, you, you're not wrong. It's not a lot. But NASA, their budget experiences huge swings year to year you know it's not like CERN who have a percentage of GDP that they can kind of plan like pocket money how to spend NASA are notorious for penny pension so I, I'd argue even 100k would you know they, they'd figure out how to make that go pretty far could, could that be a reason though again devil's advocate that NASA would want to jump on the UFO bandwagon while it's hot because there's a pot of money potentially there if they do get involved, when they hear about UAP task forces being created and they hear about Congress bringing it up as a hot topic and they see some of these these younger politicians who may be future presidents or presidential candidates or VP candidates getting involved and they think, let's get in while the, the money's there and the going's good. Because like you say, they want some of that cash. Yeah, I mean, I mean, potentially, absolutely. Uh, it, it all depends what the evaluation is here. And I actually really like Nathan's suggestion that, you, you know, the truth usually ends up between the two extremes, right? It, it's a bit in the middle. And yeah, I, I was fond of Nathan's suggestion there that actually this could be an easy on-ramp. Yeah, fair. Yeah, and, and you want to stay part of the game, right? You want, as an organization, you want to be able to have a seat at the table, so without over committing, right? So maybe that that's what this is about. It's like, hey, we're, we're interested. We're the organization that should be. Uh, we're not going to dump tons of money in it because we either A, know the answer already, wink, wink, or we don't know the answer, but we want to be in a good position to hold our hand, our hat out and take some money from the coffers when those coffers really you know, fling open. Right, gents, let's get through some of these other news pieces uh, as we wrap up towards the end of this breakdown. Uh, it's been good getting back to discussing some of these bigger bigger topics and conversations, and I hope people have enjoyed it. A few more things that we'll, we'll just brush over. The Calvine fallout, as you will have seen or heard by now, folks, I'm sure that the, the famous or infamous Calvine photograph we only ever had the negatives for was published recently. Um, Dr. David Clark, who's a bit of a, a UAP media alumni now, um, newer member of the group, has been doing a lot of good work on, on the UFO, UFO subject here in the UK for, for quite some time now, many, many years. And along with Finney Adams and Dan, you got your hand in, in the, the process as well, didn't you? Managed to get this photograph out. The actual, do you know what? I can't say clear photograph because there's enough conversation happening around it that if I say clear, yeah, it's, it's not clear. We can see, though, there is an object. Um, or a reflection, depending on what side of the argument you fall down on. It's, <laughs> I, I can't see a reflection, to be fair, but I've had enough people telling me because they read it on Reddit that it's a reflection. Um, but you can see what's likely a, a diamond-shaped object and what looks like uh, some sort of aircraft plane behind it, escorting, guiding, whatever it may be. Um, taken in Calvine, Scotland in uh, early 1990, in the Hills it was famously what Nick Pope has dined out on for, for 30 years of his career as well. And now the photographs come out. It's prompted a whole lot of discussion across the world. Um, the photographs come out, though, and it's been really interesting to see the reaction. And I think, honestly, it's kind of ended up where I thought it would, that very quickly it, it hit a peak and then went away because what photograph is going to be enough for people now? And I think it would be a case of if we got that black triangle photograph coming out the water i think it would be exactly the same conversation that i just can't see photographs being enough for anyone anymore yeah i i would agree with you you, you know we we have 
basically the story goes that there were two two gentlemen uh, hiking in Scotland and they saw this craft in the sky. They hid in the bushes and uh, shot off six photographs of, of this thing hovering there. Meanwhile, it's being kind of flown around by by a uh, plane. It's up for debate what that plane is. Some people say Harrier, other people say other things. Uh, but yeah, they got off six, those six photographs, sent them to the, the Daily Record in Scotland, who kind of work with the RAF, the MOD, to kind of get the materials to them. And then, long story short, the materials go missing, as always happens, and, and the photo was consigned to myth. Um, what's interesting is that as soon as this came out, you, you almost had people kind of saying that it was a hoax um, and ignoring the one, you know, it came with image analysis that kind of showed that, you know, this wasn't just a hoax photograph. You, you know, we, we kind of prepped on that front, but also the the kind of the backstory of the, the photograph and what happened as well, where you have, like I say, it's not one photograph, it's six photographs that the, the MOD had to study. And that organization, uh, it's not the MOD, it's uh, JARIC, the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Center. So they had six times the data. They determined that it was a Harrier. They determined that it was more than likely, but couldn't conclusively say that it w was, you know, uh, an object in the sky that was backing up the witnesses' claims. And then you had people, again, ignoring the witness testimony. Now, as always, this would be easier if the witnesses were, were to come forward and actually have the conversation with us. Yeah. But instead, we're kind of left with this information vacuum to, you know, figure out what we hope to figure out. You know, is this ET? Is this man-made? Is there a truth kind of in the middle? And when we presented this image, we we were careful to not conclude. And, you know, different members of UAP Media UK, we lean kind of slightly different ways. But the work is ongoing on this image. And it was interesting that even though that was very, you know, we were very transparent about that. You know, this investigation has been going for ages and it's still going to be going. There's still questions to answer that people were trying to conclude on it immediately. Like I say, with the sick of the data that the officials had. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, even if we had that photograph of the black triangle coming out of the ocean and the story surrounding it was that they saw it and somehow they were able to detect it and go there and take the photo. A lot of people, it just, it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough for people. So Dan, let me ask, because you're, you're very right, just while it's fresh in my mind, that people saw it. And, but this is just a social media thing, not just to do with UFOs. People saw the photograph and started making comments, completely ignoring the analysis. And folks, if you do listen to this, whether you like me or not, I don't particularly care. Um, but if you do, thanks. Um, <laughs> if, if you listen to something or you make a judgment and you make a mistake, and for example, you totally ignore the analysis, you don't have to agree with it, but if you then realize you have made a mistake, it's okay to turn around and say, ah, sorry, I missed that. I do it all the time. It's fine to hold your hands up. Some people double down on that, though, and will just argue and argue and argue or go missing from a conversation. No one no one cares. No one judges you. Well, some people might, but we don't. It's like, yeah, that's fine. You missed that. Well, here's the analysis. What do you think? There's plenty of things, and this is another point that myself, Dan, and other members of UAP Media we disagree on as well including the calvine stuff and that, again that's fine because none of us really know it would be very big-headed of either myself or dan for example to to go headstrong with any of this subject and go no this is definitely what it is and then fall out over differing opinions because we literally can't prove any of it and i would also ask dan you, you mentioned the the two witnesses haven't come forward i would also ask you what difference do you think that would even make now say they did and they gave us the story of what happened. Would it make a difference to, to anyone? And people like yourself, myself, Nathan, who maybe are a bit more inclined to take witness testimony at face value and go, oh, interesting, and put it in that little folder of evidence. But I think for, for many, a sizable number of people, it wouldn't change anything. I, I would agree with that as well. You know, for, for us, we would take it on board. It would be nice to hear it on video yeah. straight from the witnesses mouths instead of kind of because at the moment we've got it from craig Lindsay, uh, the raf officer who took the call from the witnesses and, and had the story relayed to him and he wrote it down and he remembers the testimony but we don't actually have the testimony from the witnesses mouths so it's kind of it, it's something i see as a as a weak link in the chain so to speak so for me it would strengthen that but like you say for a lot of people wouldn't make a blind air difference right like they they would want to see 
a more zoomed in photo of the craft that wasn't slightly blurry uh you, you know and even then there would still be a portion of the the world that would kind of go nope that's not what you're saying it is it's are a the fake witnesses, photo are they still alive quite possibly not it was 32 years ago so they, if they were in their i mean at any age something could have happened within 32 years good god but you know they, if they were in their 30s they'd be in their their 60s now you know and then i'll let other people do the math from there onwards but yeah it's it's a long time ago and like i say i, I don't know but nathan i'd be really interested I've, I've spoken to dan and other friends and colleagues at uap media about this quite a lot in the last couple of weeks what about yourself what have been your thoughts honestly on on the photograph and then the fallout afterwards yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for the effort that they put into getting that out there. I think it's uh, remarkable and incredible to see it. Um, You're I, welcome. I'm, yeah, especially you, Andy. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, you know, it's, for me, it's exciting. I, I, I love this stuff. Um, a photo that uh, we have been used to seeing that recreation photo for so long and to kind of have more to the story that, that we can look at, like, that's excellent. You know, we need more of that stuff. Um, to touch on kind of where you ended, though, in that in that conversation, you know, our predispositions, or at least our our societal predispositions right now are are predisposed to saying it's not anything interesting, you know, that it that it is prosaic, that that it's all a figment of our imagination. That's where most everyone's going to start. OK, um, I, what I'm looking to see just to, from a, a overall trend is when the kind of public thinking shifts over from that predisposition to, oh, you know, there is more to that. You know, I'm already there. You know, you guys are pretty much already there. We're inclined to believe these kinds of stories uh, and, and think that there's, there's something to them. Most people aren't. So when is that shift going to happen? How many pieces of information and evidence over time does it take for that switch to occur? And I, and I think I would, I don't have a, I'm not a historian, but I would love to see examples in history of something similar where there's sort of a sea change that happens in public perception of, of recognizing a fundamental truth about reality or about science or whatever it is. It takes a long time for the momentum of a culture to really shift and turn into accepting something that for so long has been told to them isn't true, right? So that, that that's one kind of aspect of the story. The other aspect of it that, that I'm interested in, I post something about it on social media, is really the degree of similarity between this photograph and the recreation. Um, and so that to me lends credence to the argument that Nick Pope really did see the photograph, really did study the photograph, and spent a lot of time with the recreation, making it match the photograph as best as possible. There's there's a, a lot of similarities between the two I images, not all. Uh, the landscape is obviously a lot more prominent and, and present in the Nick Pope, you know, recreation image than it is in the, the photo. But it's a cloudy day. The proportional shape of the object is almost exactly the same. There are several uh, sort of contours on the object which match exactly the same. And so that makes me wonder what else in the recreation photo is accurate, you know, and I, without really knowing, without Nick Pope himself coming out and explicitly telling us, you know, I don't know, but it certainly makes me speculate that there's a lot of detail in that image that is, that is on point, uh, and, and really does then kind of point us in other directions, you know, like the, the lines that you can see on that recreation. Um, there's even, at least from the way I look at it, there's even some kind of uh, almost like painted insignia or or sort of stars that you can see on the hull of the, this craft, you know. So that makes me think it's some kind of you know man-made technology. But look, we don't really know right now, and I'm going to just sort of withhold judgment on this until we have more information. I would love to hear from those witnesses. To me, that would kind of seal the deal if they came back out and put themselves out in the public and said what we heard they have said. That would that would make it really compelling. But until then, I just think it's great and I want to see more things like this. And I think we will continue to see more pieces of evidence just like this. Yeah, hope so. Dan, uh, am I right in saying as we speak and record this, uh, Vinny and David Clark, I believe, are hosting a Q&A on YouTube live, which obviously when you hear this, it won't be live anymore um, because that's how recordings work. It's it's actually so it's Vinny, David Clark, uh, Matthew, uh Giles, uh, who were all involved in the investigation, um, and also Andrew Robinson, who was the the gentleman who did the image analysis for Sheffield Hallam University. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm expecting to go from this and I'm going to dive straight in because they, they'll hopefully, you know, people that have been speculating there is a reflection and taking the opportunity to put that hypothesis to Andrew and, and to see what he's going to say. Uh, something you said, Nathan, a, a few things kind of set some things off. The The detail available in, in Nick's recreation is interesting, right? Because what we're looking at is a photo of a photo. You know, Craig had that developed, he's kept it, and now we're scanning it and showing everybody. They had the negatives. So if there was more detail in some of those images, they would absolutely be able to get that that detail out. And it's interesting that that Nick kind of placed a lot of those things there. But also, and Nick Ferdus as well, Nick threw his hands up to this when I asked him about it. He got the movement wrong in the recreation, in the motion. It, it kind of shoots sideways when that wasn't a part of it. Not to say that, you know, he, he's kind of fudging the details, but just to, you know, say that something's right, something's wrong. Um then there was the the idea that you were saying, you know, when does that shift occur? When have enough people kind of seen enough that that it becomes a societal like dough moment? Um, and and that is what I was highlighting earlier with Thomas Kuhn. I, I suggest people go read his kind of work. And he proposed that it took about took about forty to fifty years. But of course, he came up with this theory before this age of communication. So I'm I'm really curious if there's another kind of similar theory out there. You know, maybe proposing that this shift happens faster now that we're all talking a lot more and we've got access to more information. Uh, that would be really interesting. But ultimately, I love that, and I'm going to use this as a, as a little segue. Um, I love that you said, I don't know, because that's so important to be able to say these days. I don't know is okay to say. <laughs> and people do it in all sorts of walks of life. So I think our politicians would be better off if they were okay saying, I don't know. You know, the DOD might be a bit more transparent about the UAP issue if they were able to say, we don't know. You know, we've studied this for ages. And and that is something that fighter pilot Ryan Graves said on the, on the Lex Friedman podcast too. He was asked, what do you think this is? And he refused to conclude. He just said, I don't know. And he, there was a wider conversation around it that involved a lot of speculation. But in the midst of that was that key phrase, I don't know. And it was like magic to you for me in, in that interview. Absolutely. Yeah, good points, gents. Listen, let's move on to uh, Gary Nolan a couple of weeks ago appeared on uh, Tucker Carlson today, or Carlson Tucker, as Dan called it earlier. Some of you may have noticed. I didn't want to correct him. <laughs> but yeah, uh, on Tucker Carlson. There was a comma there in my brain, right? It's Carlson, I, I, th comma, I thought so. That's, that's the way I heard it as well. Um, it's been a few weeks now, but again, I've got as my first note here, folks, politics aside, okay, some of you don't like Tucker Carlson. He's the US Piers Morgan, basically, as, as we see it. Um, for me, Gary Nolan, absolutely superb. Charisma is off the charts, speaks incredibly well. And this is before we knew he was appearing um, as, the, as the main highlight of Ross Coulthart's documentary. Um, I think Gary's been a breath of fresh air in the community. I think he's he's got very comfortable speaking online as well on Twitter. He will joke with people back and forward. He will engage in conversation. He'll share memes. Um, it can go from really serious topics of conversation to more lighthearted ones. I think he's been a great, a great character and personality all round to be to be introduced into the conversation, especially when whether you liked him or not, you, you lost a Lou Elizondo who was making some fantastic claims or tidbits or conversational topics on Twitter. To lose that and then have Gary Nolan's been a very, a very nice substitute. Um so uh, some of the highlights for me from that conversation, um, he was approached in 2011 by the CIA to examine pictures of individuals who may have been injured by UFOs. He wants to collate data and convince other scientists that the data is real. Like Dan was saying before, Gary Nolan isn't interested right now in the conclusions. He just wants to show scientists, look at this data we have, get involved, help us help us work out what this could be. Um, very sensible approach. Um, he was told this would ruin his reputation. He said his reputation is going against the grain and it's unscientific not to study it. And if you don't want to, you aren't a scientist, you're a priest, which was quite a, quite a funny line from it. Um, really one interesting one I liked. Tucker asks what the folks Gary hangs around with, and we know some of those at least, or those circles, what they think this is. And the people in the know, according to Gary, believe it. it's not from Earth. And Gary, again, is a very serious individual. Am I right in saying, is he Nobel nominated or Nobel award winning? Nominated. Nominated. Ah, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's nothing, is it? Um, we've, all, we've all been nominated for a Nobel Prize. Hey, that, that might be good, though, because a lot of uh, Nobel nominees go on to have some crazy ideas and crazy theories, almost like they're, they're giving carte blanche to just do whatever they want, which they are, to be fair. But yeah, some some of them get a little out there. I was just having the discussion today that uh, Liberty X as a band were more successful than Hearsay. 
who actually won <laughs> uh, pop stars back in the day. Um, if you remember like X Factor and such, Nathan, like those types of reality singing shows. Um, I'm trying yeah. not to. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, very similar conversation. That's a very small number of people will appreciate that that comment and reference. But I did say that today. Um, so there's a lot of data from USOs on um, the unidentified submerged objects, a really interesting area we hear so little about, really. Congress's job is now to make the Navy and other departments give the DOD the data and report consistently, setting aside NDAs and oaths. So um, I want to ask you both a question, sort of on what I said before about we lost Lou Elizondo, whether you like him, hate him, or are indifferent to him or on UFO Twitter. Um, it makes it sound like he's passed away. Yeah, we've lost yeah. him. We've lost Lou. Condolences. Yeah, <laughs> although he's making comments again online. Okay, but again, literally, I I don't care whether people like him or not. That's that's their own opinion. They're allowed to have that. And like Lou always said himself, follow the data and and question me, question everything. That's that's fine. Um, but we've got access to people like Lou Elizondo now and Gary Nolan. And James Fox, Chris Chris Mellon, almost said Christopher Nolan. He's on Twitter probably, but different guy. And at one stage, not too long ago, these individuals, these roles, they were they were faceless. Or what we had was a picture of them in their army uniform with, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, such and such, and that was it. And their whole status was based in myth and lore and they were involved in a crash retrieval at Roswell or they were behind the men in black you know it was just stories and there was no basis to it they, they might as well have not really existed whereas now we do have access to these people and these individuals who actually worked in these programs and work with these people and have this incredible knowledge of this subject that we all all want to know so much more about they're replying to your conversations within minutes. You could be sitting making dinner for your kids and you could receive a reply from Chris Mellon, who is literally the Undersecretary of Defence, you know, for the Bush administration and whatnot. And that that can happen now and you get it from all sorts of walks of life and celebrities. Has that in a way ruined a lot of the conversation that people can now have direct conversations back and forward with these people does it, and I'll go to you first here, Nathan, does it does it water down the conversations or the impact some of these people and their, their quotes can actually have? I love this question because it speaks to whether you're more in love with the mythology here, uh, with, with the fantasy or with the reality. And it turns out reality is actually pretty messy uh, and complicated. Real people aren't you know, sort of flat one dimensional objects, you know, they, they, they've got opinions, some of them wrong, some of them good. Uh, people have charisma, or in some cases, a lack of it, right? Uh, if you know who these people are, you got to deal with all those things, you know, you got to face them head on. And, and to your point, it's exciting, we can have those interactions. And I think that to me, that's very thrilling. But to many others, you know, when these people become real, they step out of the shadows of that mythical, you know, scientist or mythical military person who's working at the secret base, you know, that studies this, whatever, like it, it you know, they would r- much rather have that story. They want that, that story. And they get really angry to have to deal with the reality of a flawed set of people who are doing their very best to study something that, quite frankly, may be very much beyond our ability to comprehend it, you know, and it just sort of speaks too to the sort of, uh, requirements that people seem to have for uh, their kind of perfect, excellent spokesperson for this topic. You know, what kind of pedigree and credentials does somebody have to have, in other words, for them to step forward and everyone be like, that's exactly the person with an unblemished background. Everything about them is so fantastic that everything that they say is something I can take to the bank and believe in. I, I, there is no person, that person does not exist, you know? So it, it's, it, it really, to me, it's, it's like watching this whole thing kind of unfold. It, it's like it, for the longest time, this story has been this kind of closed flower that is, you know, still pretty and nice to see, but as the petals start kind of coming open, you're actually looking at what it really is. And there's a lot of stuff going on in there and we're just kind of having to grapple with what that is but I think you can appreciate it in its sort of fullness now. And, and we're going to need more of that. We're going to need more people 
with Gary Nolan's pedigree and and uh, with the, those in the intelligence community stepping forward, the more voices who are adding their thoughts, their time, their energy to this, regardless of their complicated histories, the more that this cannot be ignored. Dan, same question. I, I agree. It's a really good question. I, I've been working my way through the, the second uh three three body problem book or the remembrance of earth past uh series book and there's a really great quote in there where one of the characters says once you know the world turns narrow and that can be taken as positive or negative depending on what we're trying to do in this case we're trying to narrow it down and we're kind of moving the subject from being an unknown unknown into a known unknown so we know the questions to ask and and the more questions we can define the more we will define the thing itself at some point and Lou Elizondo has said this, ufology as we know it will die. And we kind of have to make a choice. Is is ufology something that just exists because of an information gap and, and a vacuum? Or is it something that exists because of these objects in the sky? Because if it's the objects in the sky, at some point that goes away. The world will turn narrow. The monsters at the edge of the map will become defined. And we won't be kind of talking in the corners in hushed voices about these things. But the positive of that is that we will start having the materials available to build things with. We'll start understanding the propulsion and the, you know, the, the impact that it has on us as humans. And if it involves something to do with consciousness, that kind of changes the world in that way. So yeah, you know, the, the world turns narrow and the subject kind of gets slimmer. But for me, that's a good thing. But I know there are people out there who, who enjoy kind of healthy careers in that gray area. You know, I know this has been a topic of conversation recently. John Greenwald put up the Lou's exact quote, and I remember, I remember the interview, not remembering exactly when it was, where Lou talked about, you know, I want to burn down ufology and such and such. To be fair, Lou is part of uh, an expo next year. He never made it up, but with the tagline for Awakening is "Ufology Evolved." For me, and again, there's some 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 individuals who may be there that. I would question the legitimacy of what they're going to discuss, etc. But I don't think ufology as we know it will die. I would suggest that it'll branch off, um, which I think it's been doing anyway, because I think there's always going to be an audience for, again, if tomorrow the Tic Tac landed on the White House lawn and some aliens got out of it and people were vindicated and Bob Lazar's saucer model landed and they went, ah, I told you I was right. I think there would still be uh, a group of people who would want to know about the Black Knight satellites and your your uh, David Wilcox and you know your Linda Moulton House and your Star Seeds and all those things that would still be like way off of being proven or potentially even proven to be kind of nonsense. If aliens came down and said Stephen Greer was talking total nonsense, there would still be a I think an audience for that. So I don't think ufology will die or or be burned down. I definitely think it'll branch off and Dan to what you were saying about it going into almost different compartments where there's a real serious aspect of it. And I talked about this with Steve Mera when I talked about the direction of future expos and conferences being more data driven. I think you'll see more of a change where you see more of a mix. And if that means you start to see the debrief with Tim McMillan, Mikey Hanks and others at a conference along with someone discussing star seeds and Palladian experiences along with the Kinsella twins talking about their abduction experiences over the years, followed by a lecture by Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon. Maybe that's what does happen during a transitional period, but I can't see it going away just because of where we're at and just look at all the things that have happened just in the last few years where there are so many audiences who who want to go the other way in a conversation, who, who maybe don't want to look at the facts, they look at facts selectively, or do you know what? They just choose to read their own narratives and that's not just in UFOs, that's that's across the board for me. And I think we've seen enough examples of that that yeah, it's it's people are going to pick and choose their their camps, but I think I'd like to try and sit as much as I can. I'm very honest and say who I do and don't support in terms of their ideals and you know, I hope people like Lou have been honest and I, I'm sure it, I know Lou worked where he said he worked. However, I want him to be proven right. Same with Bob Lazar. I want Lazar to come out and eventually be vindicated that he did work where he worked and all the spurious little details that I don't really care about. And I think, Nathan, you may have mentioned this earlier and other people, who, who are, who's going to care ultimately when we find out what these things are and that they're they're not of a human intelligence? 
you know, they're, they're non-human, they're, they're something else, they're from elsewhere, a different time, reality, planet, galaxy, whatever it may be, who's going to turn around and say, oh yeah, but Bob Lazar's background was spurious, so wasn't it? And he didn't actually go to college properly like he said he did. It won't matter. It's It, it won't matter anymore. So, so yeah, it's... I don't know, just that, that was an interesting point for me on on having access to these personalities and, and for many, I wonder if it does change the conversation because, again, what you see over over tweets and Instagrams and DMs is very different to what people would say to them face-to-face. So, But yeah, that goes for all walks of life. So, interesting. Thank you, gents, for that. Um, Richard Dolan made a few quotes on Jimmy Church a few weeks ago. A bit of a wild interview in terms it was a bit all over the place. Dan, I think you watched some of it. And, and Nathan, I don't know if you managed to catch any of it and what they bit. discussed. Yeah. Um, a lot of back patting and, and Jimmy's inimitable style. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting one. But some of the quotes Richard Dolan came out with, maybe slightly juxtapositioned, are one, we are seeing a walk back of the UFO revelations of 2017. Toothpaste is being put back into the tube. I thought that was an interesting quote. He also mentioned we're in the midst of a global revolution and cannot be turned back. And for me, that was two very differing comments on a similar subject. Uh, Dan, what do you think about Richard Dolan saying we're in the midst of things being walked back in terms of what came out in 2017? And this is all leading to to what I was getting at earlier, that things may go, you know, the genie may go back in the bottle. The I mean, the, there's been some talk of the more transparent the DOD are going to be with this, the more careful they have to be. So actually they're erecting some new walls that we didn't have before. The difference is we just know that they're there, you know, publicly they're honest about those walls being present. So I can kind of see where he's coming from in some respects, but just like, and I've mentioned this movie before contact, the best part of that narrative for me is where the knowledge that we're not alone is just kind of left to simmer with the human race whilst a bunch of kind of moving parts happen. And it has such a big sociolo- sociological impact that it kind of almost doesn't matter that the wall's being put up because people people will start paying attention when this makes a difference to their lives. And like you, you've both alluded to, we're, we're in a position now where the government, the US government has said, this is a real thing. We're, we're being given permission to go study it. We're essentially being told. All the people that kind of thought there was something else around the world for all this time, you were right. And we're not going to spend the time saying, I told you so. A lot of us are, are very kind of community minded. You know, we're, we're going out and we're talking to our friends and family about them. So whilst I see where, where Dolan is coming from in that regard, I, I think that the toothpaste is out of the tube and you can't put it back in. It's just that we know where the tube is now. That's all. Can you put the toothpaste somewhere else though? You could put it in a bowl if you wanted to, a I jar. guess. But yeah, in a, a jar. Pop. You could. <laughs> and then hide that device. I, is what I I'm do getting enjoy at. I'm, I'm, toothpaste bowl. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about obviously the cleaning of it's toothpaste. That's up to yourselves, <laughs> folks. But, you know, is there a chance that the toothpaste comes out, but very quickly is collected and, and hidden away? I mean, it, it almost doesn't matter, you know, if, if the public has seen it, if this knowledge is out there, that there's a there there, that we are not alone on Earth, whatever you might make of that, whatever the conclusion is, there's something other here. That's the bit that matters on a daily basis to, to people that they can start reflecting, you know, what is what is the difference between us and something else that has occupied this planet for longer than we have? You know, what does it mean to be human? It's going to start having impact on us in, in a lot of different ways, a lot of ways that we can't predict. So uh, yeah, like I say, I see where Dolan's coming from, but in, in another way, I, I think he's talking about a very specific thing um, and the, the societal ramifications of the toothpaste even existing in the first place and it being acknowledged. That's that's the goods for me. You know, that that's what changes the world. Nathan, that's right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, you know, what is the actual toothpaste here? You know, is the toothpaste a piece of technology? It is, is it this fundamental truth? Is it a narrative? Uh, you know, the truth is that the government will always want to put a narrative on whatever it happens to be. But I think, Dan, you're spot on that, you know, just acknowledging that the toothpaste is there to begin with, uh, that it's not just a tube. There is something inside of it of substance. You know, that to me is uh, we're, we're past that that point. That momentum uh, is moving and in, in, in continuing to move. I don't think we're going to go back to a place where we pretend that, that it's not there. Uh, but as to what that actually is or what the interpretations of what that toothpaste might be, uh, that is still open to debate. You know, how much 
of this story can they uh, manage and control? How much do they really know? You know, I think that that's something we've all speculated about for a long time. You know, to what degree do we really understand what it is that we're dealing with here, whether it be a singular thing or or many things? And I think many have concluded that one of the main reasons we we haven't been told is that they just don't really know. They don't really understand what it means and what it is. And that's a bad place to be when you're a government that is responsible for a lot of people, not just your own citizenry, but really kind of the, uh, in many ways, the, the way the world will react to this uh, particular issue. Yeah, fair points. Um, James Fox recently was interviewed by Howard Hughes on The Unexplained. Um, I believe this was a very scenic interview. I think he was on like a skyscraper in New York or some sort of balcony. It looked lovely. Um, and he alluded to, Nathan, I'll come to you for this one, that he had, had seen some pretty interesting photographic evidence. Now, his his Moment of Contact documentary isn't out yet. We'll review that when the time is coming. And I've spoke to James Fox, and he'll let me know when screeners and stuff are going to go out. I'm looking forward to seeing that one, as I'm sure Dan is as well. And I'm sure you are, Nathan. Um, however, he was asked about evidence and whatnot and this isn't in the documentary apparently but he alluded to having seen something that was pretty much smoking gun-esque evidence and also offered quite a substantial sum of money for anyone who could present him with said photographic or video evidence as well nathan what was your take on james's his conversation and what he was saying regarding this I thought it was uh, very interesting. You know, James is very good about, uh, you know, kind of teasing things and also trying to protect what he's saying, not overcommit, not overpromise, which in a way basically makes it even more interesting that you want to get, get your hands on that. So, you know, I found that to be uh, quite intriguing, but I think it speaks back to Dan's point earlier, you know, how much is enough for us to really be convinced of anything. And it could be a photo or a video or what have you. And a very compelling story, but it's not going to convince everyone. But to, you know, to me, it's one more, hopefully, one more brick in this wall uh, that kind of composes this story. And when you when you step back and look at them collectively, you know, it's something that becomes pretty hard to ignore. That that that's what we're after here is just uh, that that mounting evidence that cannot be ignored any longer. So you know, I'm excited by it. I hope he gets what he wants. Um, I hope we get, you know, more of all of the above. Dan, any thoughts on James Fox's comments? There wasn't a whole lot more uh, around it other than that. And he's obviously getting ready to promote and talk about moment of contact. But your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to repeat too much, but the the idea of whether it would be something definitive uh, is something that pops into my head when he's thinking about that footage. And he was careful to kind of downplay it and kind of suggest that maybe we won't see it. Um, and, and there was some conversation around offering the person money for it. And, and that always worries me. You know, we, we were very fortunate with the Calvin image that Craig Lindsay, the RAF officer, actually his only condition of handing it over was that if we end up selling prints of it, that the money goes to Sheffield Hallam University for research and to charity, which I thought was a beautiful gesture on his part. But we have seen throughout history other people kind of taking taking golden nuggets like that and using them to kind of get their moment in the limelight, which I don't begrudge. You know, if you've got it, you've got it. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll withhold judgment until I kind of see the documentary and see that that footage if it's in there. Yeah, I've always been fascinated, side note, on the, the footage that James Fox heard of with, was it Chuck Clark? where apparently the two two guys out in the desert basically film a UFO over their car. And it's apparently the most incredible footage. It never got released. It's been heard of in various shows. If you see, search out any James Fox interviews, I know Howard Hughes, one from a few years ago particularly, goes into some really nice detail on it and stuff as well. But some of that stuff that just sounds too good to be true is the stuff that we just unfortunately don't get to see. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate. And, you know, the, so the saying goes, if it, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. So so temper your expectations. Big hype just equals big letdown. So I'm, I'm you know sure what? it'll be good. It's James Fox. But Do you know yeah. what? I'm going to put myself out there, Dan. I am going to offer going for cash. It? I'm going to offer cash to anyone who can send me top, top quality. If you can send me that footage of the abduction attempt over the car, um, 50 quid. 
is yours. I will I will transfer that money. Um, I, I can Vince tell Fox you that's money. a very low offer, and that the gentleman that has it has been offered a lot more than than that. And, and what if we threw in a toothpaste bowl? Mm. I think that'll do. Yeah, one a, a really kind of you know Decorative kitschy, maybe from Harrods, you know, <laughs> and a signed copy of the skies above um, <laughs> from, from me as well. Um, Sold. Yeah, sorry, that's as high as I can go, folks. My wife would kill me otherwise. You know, so there we go. <laughs> um, and kind of final thoughts. Um, Hal Putoff released a paper again a few weeks ago now, early August, I believe it was. Uh, I am not the guy to go to for comment on papers that have been released, you know, peer-reviewed documents, all that kind of stuff that you two guys normally are. Um, have you both read the paper from Hal Putov or at least mm-hmm. seen the, the gist? Yeah. yeah, good. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a wrap. Nathan, we'll come to you first then. Uh, thoughts on the paper itself? It kind of got launched, not launched, but it got released online and it kind of came and went quite quick with only a bit of comment and then that was it. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I was I, excited to read it. Uh, it was not very like revelatory, and that tells me that we that the, the sort of idea, the ultra terrestrial hypothesis idea, is just so well, you know, saturated in our community already that it wasn't something that I hadn't heard before. Uh, it's great to see in writing, um, and it, the whole story of the release just seems sort of funny. I mean, it had been floating around the community for a long time. I had not seen it, but I knew lots of people who had seen it. And, uh, you know, I just sort of got this mental image of, you know, how put off just kind of being like, ah, fine, let's just go ahead. Like, it's not like it's he was sitting on some sort of bombshell, you know, paper. It's just like I think he held on it too long, held on to it too, too long. And then finally it just was like, ah, you know, go ahead. Here it is. Um, I think it's great. I think we've got uh, some very compelling arguments there uh, that it's a it's a, a hypothesis that people should give a lot of attention to it does sort of you know, tie up a lot of the bits. Um, is it the whole story? Probably not, but but it's a good direction. So on that, Dan, let me ask you, because I imagine you're going to obviously follow up on what Nathan said there quite similarly. I was just going to say, yes, I agree. And that was yeah, yeah, I, I thought so, yeah. Dan's t-shirt, yes, I agree. Um, available via Redbubble. Um, many people's comments that I saw were almost disappointed that Hal seemed to be just hypothesizing and wasn't coming out as someone we assume would know a lot more than he lets on is that what nathan's getting at there that it wasn't the whole story and that is this is how giving direction maybe on the subject and areas to, to look into as opposed to actually revealing what he knows because we would be disappointed if that was just it i'm guessing yeah you know the the paper itself seems to suggest that hal's very much you know he doesn't have any kind of secret knowledge that that we're not aware of but what this paper does is it is it lays out a few hypotheses really well and kind of says, well, look, you know, there, there are ways that we can break these hypotheses down. If there was such a thing as, you know, uh, an ultra terrestrial human group, we would see maybe them kind of trying to mix in with us. And and that would kind of cause, you know, some spurious research that comes out of nowhere into genetics or into a material craft, in which case that's a fingerprint of that kind of you know, thing going on. Uh, He goes into a number of different scenarios and looks at what fingerprints they would leave. And I came away from the paper with the ultimate point that he's making, essentially, is that we have to be willing to stop just speculating and actually define what it is we're saying and come up with a testable hypothesis to press that to the limit to see, essentially, if it's, it's the real thing. Um, because a lot of these things we can take off the table through the evidence that we have or don't have. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't really, you know, concluding that any particular hypothesis was favorable. It was just kind of saying, you know, look, you know, if if it's ET, there will be these telltale signs that it's ET. And we can start talking about what those telltale signs are and working the speculation and the data that we have so that instead of us just all having our favorite stories, we have our favorite genuine hypothesis that's been well-rounded and thought out. Awesome. Anything else, gents, you guys want to talk about before we finish up? Just really quickly, I mean, the topics we hit on here, like imagine us talking about this stuff three years ago. Like take one of these, it would have been like a huge news week or news month, but we just went through several of them. You know, a top scientist who's put his reputation on the line, uh, a photograph of an incident that we've been talking about for 30 years, uh, a hypothesis from someone who's been close to this subject for so long, who's really knowledgeable, 
that we've been hearing rumors of for so long and seeing it and reading it. I mean, it's an exciting time, you know, and I think that it's easy to lose sight of that because we're just now kind of numb. We just want that next hit of, of dopamine from a news release or whatever. But if you just step back and look at everything that's happening right now, it is very hard to ignore, in my opinion, the, the real momentum that, that's happening here. Yeah. And for, for me, as someone who just likes talking about UFOs, uh, as I've said, and Dan, we were discussing this yesterday as well, privately, people can forget that and get lost in the noise with that sometimes that ultimately that's why many of us enjoy this subject. It's, you know, came into it as a kid with a fascination or a sighting or an experience. Uh, and here we are with real progress happening behind the scenes. Could it all in the coming days, weeks, months and years go away and we're back to square one? Yeah, you, c you can't say it 100% that it couldn't, but it's looking like it's in a really good place and we're getting some kind of progress. And as much as we can help keep the discussion going, move it forward. If you're, especially if you're in the US, if you can get in touch with congressmen and women, if you want to make sure, you know, you can you can lobby uh, big phone home three just happened with ucr didn't it and again there was petitions up there mick west has signed a petition to get gimbal footage released that's great because i would love to see the longer version of the gimbal video if you can in any way shape or form help by sharing conversation if you see clips online of interviews you like if you see tucker carlson speaking to gary nolan comment on it like engage same with facebook instagram share this information and maybe some of your friends and colleagues and just, you know, mutual connections will see these things. And it broadens that UFO discussion because it is getting more and more into the mainstream. And that can only be a good thing for the moment. So just two things to wrap up from me. Uh, one is uh, a shout out to James Iandoli, who, who's had a few magnificent interviews on his channel over the past month or so. You know, he's had Jim Semivan back and they've really mm -hmm. kind of gone into detail on things. And he's just spoken to Peter Lavenda, who writes the the non-fiction uh, books with with To The Stars Academy yeah. or To The Stars now, which is Be To The Stars. Um, and that's one I haven't watched yet. But in the interview that you had with uh, Jim Semivan, there was a lot of people noticed that there was a DMT book set in the background, which obviously kind of leans towards the consciousness side of things. It was interesting that that, that was there. Uh, he, he also kind of referenced what's known as the Ellicinian Mysteries, which was, uh, there was a place called Eleusius that people would, kind of take a pilgrimage to way back when and they would take a substance and be kind of told a truth of, of consciousness and the universe and everything and the secret was supposedly that if you die before you die then when you die you don't die that's a bit of a mouthful but it's kind of getting that there's something more after this life waiting for us and that right now we are kind of cocoons and and you know there's a great Leslie Keen series uh, on Netflix that goes into the afterlife stuff and I'd implore mm -hmm. everyone to watch it. And yeah, it, it was just really intriguing that it came up again in a UAP conversation. Apparently to the stars have kind of six other treatments. Tom, Tom has alluded to one called wild men. Um, and we know that Tom has said before that he, he's been looking at mixing truth with fiction. And the story of the wild men is that there are, seems to be a species of people that can appear as shadows and kind of, looking at our innermost workings of our governments and things like that so that that should be interesting supposedly hal putoff has a remote viewing prod film in the work in the works which is a very kind of serious take on you know mirage man and things like that which would be interesting that's the first we've heard of it and and immediately as soon as jim said it he was like oh i wasn't meant to put that out who knows if he was meant to or not great bit of marketing i'm talking about it now yeah. <laughs> um Scout and Vault, their apps and database are apparently all set up and developed, ready to go. They're just waiting on kind of getting the thumbs up from their partners. And Sammy Van finished that interview by just saying, UAPs are real, the phenomenon is real, keep the faith and good luck, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, again, you know, a bit of a mic drop moment. Then the other thing that I just wanted to mention is that there was a, a great movie that came out called Prey. It was a predator film. And for me, there were, there were a number of things contained in it that kind of hit on some, some of the things that we talk about to do with the phenomenon. Number one being is that there's a moment where the main character, I'll be as loose with this as possible because please go watch it. It's a, it's a really interesting movie. The main character sees the predator for, predator for the first time and goes running and she bumps into her, her tribe and she's trying to describe what she's seen to them. And she's struggling for language. She can't She can't describe it because there's nothing there that she's seen before. So she describes it as kind of a giant bear. And we know that the predator creature doesn't look like a bear, but that's the best that she has. And it made me think of the whole dino beaver debacle where some people are kind of treating that as a silly statement. And sure, mm -hmm. 
saying that there's a dino beaver it sounds like something from you know avatar the last airbender where they just mush two creatures together and have a bit of fun with it but actually that's a human being in a moment of trauma and probably ptsd seeing something that's so far outside the wheelhouse that they go in trying to take in the details and maybe they saw it had a flat tail maybe they saw it kind of looked like a reptile but that came out as dino beaver so I just wanted to mention that because I think it's important that when we're talking to witnesses and experiences that we don't take their phrasing literally that we're you know we record it but we can be a little loose with concepts when people say things like dino beaver and yeah I just wanted to make sure I got that in because yeah it's important one small detail Dan got wrong there the uh, prey movie is good not great um, but I would encourage people to watch it um, <laughs> um where can people bet on our fight just just uh, to let them know nah, <laughs> whoever wins that's <laughs> they're wasting our money I would destroy you um but no, you probably was, would, yeah. I, I enjoyed it I no I enjoyed it Dan like I said to you I think I said to you I, I did and on reflection I was like ah, it, it wasn't great it's not the best but it's yeah it was good I was pleasantly surprised I'll put it that way because Dan, you remember I was very privately, I was quite pretty negative about the whole thing coming out. I was like, I don't like the look of this whatsoever, but um I did enjoy it. Um and it's really interesting, like you say, about the language. And I always think back to, you know, how did people describe the sky before we had a word for the color blue? You mm-hmm. know, it's just how how would you describe that? There was no language for it. And again, great, great example of Dino Beaver, because it is a ridiculous way to describe it. But if if something did look like that's the best way you could do it then yeah so, something your kids would come out with isn't it that i saw something like a dinosaur beaver thing you're like oh okay but maybe that's what it did look like who knows um but also just to say jim semivan will be joining myself at the end of september on the podcast um very busy gent but that's been arranged for a few weeks now finally got in touch with dates and stuff and i believe he's on calling all beings nathan which i'm sure you'll be on that that's one right. Thursday night up. this week. Thursday, yeah. yep. There you go. Um, so Jim Semivan going on to some of the pods as well, which is great to see. Um, maybe he'll get his friend Tom to come back and talk to the UFO community, <laughs> which has ploughed so much money into two of the stars over the years. Um, there's one of the investors right there, Dan, looking for a return on his money. Um, just with I actually, I, I found my bit of paper with my shares detailed on them the other day because I was moving. And I was like, should I throw these out? No, I've kept them. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. And you always said you never expected anything back, but it'd be nice if Tom came out and just addressed the UFO community that he's about to market a movie towards and no doubt want us to go and see it. And we will anyway. You know, shut up and take my money. <laughs> Don't um, tell him that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's all, folks. Uh, in a couple of days' time, that in my interview with Rizvan Vark on simulation theory, uh, multiverse hypotheses, how UFOs and all sorts of consciousness can be involved in that as well, will be out. Um, later in the week, Dan and I will record our NOPE review. We'll send that out on all the feeds. And um, that won't just be a Patreon exclusive or anything like that, um, because that's one we're really interested in talking about and sharing our thoughts on that. Lots of you have done that already. If you want to share any questions, thoughts, opinions on the Nope movie, seems quite divisive in, ma- in many, many ways. Send those over at UFO, UAP, AM at gmail.com. And yeah, lots to come. So I've enjoyed this. Nathan, thank you very much again for coming on. Always a welcome voice. My pleasure. Absolutely. Been great having you and we'll get you back on again. And Dan, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Great to be here as always. Thanks for listening. And Nathan, yeah, absolute pleasure. The school holidays have arrived in my household and Let's Make Art, a new podcast sponsor, has been a real smash hit. Their custom art boxes have gone down a treat with not only the little, but the big kids in my house as well. Whether it's a miserable day and you're stuck indoors or you want to just have a chill day at home, but enjoy the sun outside, there really is a custom art box for you. Anyone can have an art supplies delivered right to their door in the form of monthly subscriptions, project kits and supplies for a variety of different activities. Whether like me, you're a total beginner, an absolute amateur or you've mastered the arts, the supplies and tutorials in each art box, they are designed to encourage, support and enhance your experience with art. Go to Let's Make Art dot com and start your next art project today and be sure to use promo code ufo art in the checkout and you will save 20 percent off your order that's a huge 20 percent off i've posted my special link in the show notes so you can go to zen.ai forward slash ufo art for 20 percent off and thank you to let's make art for sponsoring this episode 
that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access the shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course on twitter it's at ufo uap am and again folks as always keep looking up you never know what you might see It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should see because it doesn't really scare me. If you really want to know who I think they'd be, I think it's you and me and us and we and him and her and that and she and that thing over there and what's that, Jay? Consider your space, consider your lies, consider your life, consider your eyes.